Welcome back, everyone. I am honored to introduce you to our next speaker. Bill Schmelzer was hospitalized for 48 days back in 2016. He was in isolation for 45 of those 48 days. And over the next hour, Bill's going to share his personal experience with a head-on collision with septic bacteremia, MRSA. He will explore the physical, emotional, and financial implications of his experience that continues three years after the initial crisis. Bill, I will hand it over to you. Good morning, everybody. It's an honor to be here. Um, in 2016, so four and a half years ago, I became a surgical site infection statistic. While I volunteered for the surgery, I didn't volunteer for the infection. Becoming a data point in the Center for Disease Control database for hospital-acquired surgical site infection is not a goal that anybody sets for themselves. I did a Google search on my bucket list I couldn't find that one. There's about 160,000 surgical site infections annually in the U.S., at least that's the number that I have. The, the, the statistics suggest that there's about 30% readmission rate of those 160,000 surgical site infections. Average length of stay will be 7 to 11 days. The fatality rate is projected at about 10%. I would put it at about $5,000. 5,000 patients if the, the original number is correct. The estimated cost of all of this, the lowest number in the literature is about $3.5 billion. The highest number, $10 billion from the American College of Surgeons. Whatever that $6.5 billion difference between the lowest estimate and the highest estimate suggests to me that we have absolutely no idea what the cost of all of this is. And none of that calculates the physical and emotional impact on the patient, the patient's family, and the sur surgical practitioner. And I'll talk more about that at the end. There are three stated objectives. I have, I have three unstated objectives. I'll share the unstated objectives with you at the conclusion. The stated objectives to describe the physical, emotional, and financial impact of this one surgical site infection to discuss the critical need for patient advocacy for the patient who cannot self-advocate. This is the very essence of nursing, perioperative responsibility, and of, the, and of the sterile processing professional. And to describe the, the appropriate use of PPE in relationship to the isolate patient. I was hospitalized for 48 days. I was an isolate for 45 of those 48 days. And if they could have gotten the diagnosis faster, it would have been all 48 days. I sold PPE for 31 years. I saw stuff, and I'll share some of those observations with you. The title, MRSA Personal Case Study, came from a discussion I had with a hospitalist after 21 consecutive days in the hospital. Toward the end of the conversation, she said, you know, you have really been a very challenging case. To which I replied, you know, you never want to be, Doc. You never want to be a case study. In the fall of 2015, it became obvious to me I needed to do something about my hips. My left one was killing me. My right one wasn't much better. I vetted finding a surgeon the same way any one of, of, the, of you in this audience would. You're in the business. You either already know the one you would go to or you network to find the one you want to go to for whatever the need might be. And I did the same thing. And when I narrowed down to the surgeon that I thought was the right choice, I dug pretty deep. I talked to someone who circulated his cases. I talked to someone who had scrubbed his cases. I talked to the manager of the department. I talked to the manager of sterile processing. I talked to the tech that did his instruments most of the time. I talked to everybody. And I got positive response from everybody. He was described as competent, capable, caring. When I met with him for the first time, we went over the first x-ray. He said, well, which one are we doing first? Because they both look terrible. I said, well, the left one hurts a lot more. He said, okay, we'll do the left one first. And the plan was to do the right one shortly thereafter. That was four and a half years ago. I'm still waiting to do the right one. The diagnosis was severe arthritis. My preoperative assessment was on 12-23. My CBC was all within normal ranges. I had essentially no comorbidities to speak of other than chronologically. I was 64 years of age at the time. Other than that, 
a really healthy guy. Never smoked, don't drink much, never was a drug user, not a diabetic, no history of cancer. I was on no medications whatsoever other than a Tylenol extra strength every six or eight hours to alleviate some of the discomfort in the hips. Regular exercise and a reasonably healthy diet of an pathetic weakness for chocolate chip cookies. My CBC was all within normal ranges. I had essentially no com no issues. I was swabbed for MRSA. I was negative. Had I been positive, I, I'm pretty sure the surgeon would not have gone forward with the procedure, and I can assure you I wouldn't have, because if you're colonized, not infected, just colonized, your risk of postoperative infection goes up about somewhere between 600 and 900%. I wouldn't have taken the risk. I was positive for staff. I did the five-day mucosin routine. I followed directions carefully in trying to decolonize. If we swabbed everyone that's listening to this presentation, 30% of the audience would be positive for staff. And it might be higher because you're all healthcare workers. Preoperatively, the week of the surgery, I took four CHG showers starting on Tuesday for a Friday morning procedure. The last CHG shower at 4.30 a.m. on that Friday because I understand just like you understand, there's more bacteria on us and in us than cells that make up the entirety of the human anatomy. My preoperative weight was 157 pounds. My BMI was 25. After I took that last CHG shower, I put on all freshly laundered clothes. No old jeans with bio burden in them because the average human being sheds 100,000 particles a minute, 100 million or more particles a day a bowling ball a year, seven or eight pounds. We're not snakes. We don't shed it all at once. We shed it all the time. That's why what you wear, and just as importantly, how you wear, actually does matter. By January 8th, left hip arthroplasty, anterior approach. I chose a surgeon who could do anterior hips because I had, I had designed a drape. I worked for a Kimberly Clark. And then Halyard Health, we were a drape and gown company. I designed a drape for surgeon in a small community hospital who didn't have the luxury of an $85,000 hand table. And I was, at the, I was in the OR. He was doing a, a trial on another product. He saw me, he looked at my name badge. He said, Bill, you're the drape guy, right? And I said, well, I've been called worse. And he, he said, I'm not happy with my draping on my anterior hips. I'm doing almost all of my hips anterior approach. I'm doing them on a conventional surgical table, and I'm not happy with the draping. Would you watch the two? I have two cases this afternoon. Would you watch? So I stayed. I watched. I came up with a couple of ideas for him. One was a conventional surgical drape, but the other one was essentially a custom design for him. And he trialed it, evaluated it, evaluated it, trialed it, and he actually loved it and used it for about four years until he retired a couple of years ago. But in the process of that, he sold me on it. On interior hips, he said, my patients recover so much faster and the risk of dislocation is so much lower. Sounded good to me when I had to make that decision for myself. It was done under general anesthesia. My preoperative assessment from anesthesia was a one. My PS score was a one. Two weeks later, it will be a three. It was done under general anesthesia on the hand of table, chlor prepped a few hardware, forced air warming. Incision to close about two hours and 14 minutes. I lost about 300 cc's of blood. The procedure went a little bit long because of the complications of the bone spurs in the hip. I went home the next day. I felt great. I have birthed 12 kidney stones in my life. I understand the pain scale. Seven or eights when you're, when you're nauseated. Eight or nines when you're puking. And I don't think I've ever gotten a 10 because I, I don't think you'd be conscious. But I did exactly what they asked me to do. I walked, I elevated, and I iced. By Sunday evening, I felt so good, I had decided I'm going to Q, Q8 on the pain medication, and I'll, I'll sub Tylenol extra strength in between. Monday, I was, I, I was pretty aggressive walking, and Monday evening, there was some swelling in the extremity. And overnight and into the next day, I popped a fever of 101. So Tuesday morning, I called the surgeon, PA. He called back. I described to him what was going on. He said, hey, a little swelling and a low-grade fever, really nothing to be concerned about. Take it easy. 
back off of the walking. So, okay. But 24 hours later, by Wednesday evening, the swelling had increased. My mobility had decreased. The fever had persisted at 101. And what my wife noticed was a change, significant change in my behavior. I was agitated and irritated. And I'm a pretty easygoing, laid-back kind of guy. She was getting concerned. She went into work the next morning on Thursday. She works at the world headquarters for Victoria's Secret. She says she's saving the world one lacy thong at a time. But she was concerned. She called the physician's PA. He called her back. And they had kind of the same conversation that we had, he and I had had on that Tuesday. But she pushed him. She said, there's something wrong with this guy. You need to see him. There's something going on here. So kind of reluctantly, he said, all right, bring him down. So we went down that afternoon. It, again, when we got into his exam room, he acknowledged pitting edema, the low-grade fever. And then he sent me for a Doppler. It was negative for any evidence of DVT formation. They did not take any blood work, and they sent us home. Now, that was on Thursday. We're six days out from the surgery. On Friday night or Saturday morning, I'm not sure exactly when, he left on vacation. He's going to be gone. He's going to the Caribbean. He's going to be gone for a week for what was no doubt a well-earned vacation. I don't have any problem with that whatsoever. But over the next 48 hours, the swelling increased, the pain level increased. By Sunday evening, my wife could barely understand what I was saying. It wasn't always coming out as words or sentences. Some of it was just gibberish. Getting in and out of bed was unbelievably uncomfortable. The pain level was unbelievable. The, the leg itself, the extremity felt like it weighed 100 pounds. At about 11.45, it was thrashing around. My wife got up and took my temperature. Now it's 103.8. And that's when she hit the panic button. She called the medical bureau. Now surgeon number one is gone. Surgeon number two calls back. Surgeon number two is a senior ortho partner of this group. She described my symptoms to him in detail. His first response is, what do you want me to do at 12.15 on a Monday morning? She said, I want you to... I want you to tell me whether I need to take this gentleman to an emergency room or not. And his response, and this is a direct quote, it's really up to you. Now, I would suggest to you it really wasn't up to her. There was a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017 that suggested that for every hour of delayed intervention with sepsis, the risk of dying goes up about 4%. He didn't know it. But he had just written me a prescription for a 36% increase in the possibility that I was going to die in the next 24 hours. The other guardian angel in this story is a physical therapist. She was scheduled to come and work with me on Monday afternoon at 2 o'clock. But I had told her, look, I sell surgical products in the operating room. I'm up early every day. If you want to start your route with me rather than finish it, feel free to stop. I'll definitely be up. The doorbell rings at 8 o'clock. It's the PT. My wife sees who it is. The scores are immediately into the bedroom. She does a very fast physical assessment, turns to my wife and says, call an ambulance. Now, as fogged out as I was, and I was very confused, the one thought that occurred to me was an ambulance ride from here to the hospital has no insurance coverage, and it's a ten dollars or $11,000 cab ride. So I convinced the two of them with their assistance I could get out to the car. I don't remember a lot more about this day other than this moment. Once I got into the ER bay and they put the blood pressure cuff and the pulse oximeter on, it, the equipment took the first reading. I looked up at the monitor. It said 79 over 37, and my O2 sat level was 82%. This is the PG-13 portion of the presentation. I have to forgive the language here. I don't mean to offend anyone. But I turned back towards my wife and I said, ah, oh, shit. Because I recognized, as fogged out as I was, I recognized how serious those numbers were. My temperature was 103.7. My hemoglobin was 7. I was in pulmonary edema. I was tacky. The definition of septic shock, high temp, low blood pressure, and a major organ dysfunction, and the MOD in this case was my brain was an absolute scrambled egg. To give you some sense of that, during the 12 hours that I was in the ERB, when my wife could understand what I was saying to her, 
I kept talking about why are there bugs on the curtains in an emergency room. Now, of course, there weren't any live bugs. There may have been bacteria, but there weren't any live bugs. I was absolutely delirious, absolutely out of my mind. They did everything in the ER that you would anticipate, cardiac monitoring, IV hydration, O2 administration, small amounts of pain medication. And the doc hung a bag of vancomycin. I was admitted that night about 9 o'clock after 12 hours in the ER. The next 48 hours were finding Waldo. And you'll understand the order of this when we get to the next slide. But because I had had a GI bleed in January of 2014, so almost exactly two years to the day before this event, they decided that the, the infection must be emanating from the GI tract. So the first thing they did on the Tuesday morning was an upper GI. Now, I have absolutely no recollection of anything on Tuesday other than a little bit about Tuesday Tuesday evening. They did another Doppler. It was negative for any evidence of DDT. They did an MRI. They just took a chest X-ray. There's a story with that. And then that evening, I, they made me prep for a lower GI. Now, anybody who's had a colonoscopy knows what a miserable experience that is all by itself. And I'm as sick as I have ever been in my life. The nurse sent my wife home. She said, you do not need to witness this. And she put a crown jewel in her nursing heavenly halo that night. Because the little that I do remember is I was gagging on the juice and retching from both ends. In the nursing notes, to give you some sense of where I was, the nurse described, it, described the patient as restless, fidgeting, witness talking to himself answering unheard questions. I'm not sure who was asking the questions. I'm not sure who I was talking to. I hope that my answer sounded relatively intelligent. And this is why they went in the order that they did, in my estimation. And this is per orthopedic surgeon number two. He didn't think that the surgical site was infected. Now, according to my wife, the extremity was twice the size of my right leg but he didn't think that the leg was infected. They did the colonoscopy. It was negative for ev any evidence of bleeding or infection. They did a TEE. It was unremarkable. And then that afternoon, they finally sent me to the IR lab for hip aspiration. Now, if you think about this, the order of this probably, the whole, whole thing should have been reversed. By Wednesday afternoon, in the IR lab, Cognitively, I was with it to, enough to recognize, A, I'm in a hospital, and B, I'm in an IR lab. And I watched the doctor who was set up, and when he put the needle into the hip, he pulled back on the syringe. He pulled it out and held it up. I said, that doesn't look very good. And he said, no, this, this, this doesn't look very good. It was real milky looking. So my, first, my thought was, I think we know where we're headed. The next morning... On Thursday morning, the hospitalist comes in. She says, we have the cultures back from the blood work we took on, in the ER on Monday. It's septic bacteremia and MRSA. As soon as she left, I, I turned to my wife and said, I would like to see a priest today. This was a second big OS moment. That afternoon, the senior ortho partner comes in in the afternoon He's got his, he's in the scrubs. He's just finished his cases. He says, we're going to do an IND tomorrow. There's a possibility we're going to take out the hardware. Now, by Thursday, I was cognitively with it enough to say possibility. You and I both know it's a probability. He's turning on his heels to leave. He says, well, you're a pretty sick guy. That was an NFS moment. No shit, Sherlock. The priest came that evening. I gave confession, received communion, and the church's final blessing. I confessed every sin I'd ever thought about thinking about, much less all the sins that I'd actually committed. The priest was semi-retired. I may have retired. I'm not sure. And critical need for advocacy. This is the very essence of perioperative responsibility, and that includes the sterile processing professional. Everything that happens to the instruments before they arrive in that room dictates how successful that team is going to be with that patient. If you fail, 
they fail. So your your component in this, while you don't have direct patient contact, is absolutely critical to the outcomes of patients. In the operating room, everything matters. From the moment that surgical tech opens that and establishes that field, start the circulator starts to open the instruments, validate sterility, and they transfer into the field, maintenance of the field before the patient gets there. Preoperative timing of the antibiotics, skin prep, if there's any preoperative CHG provided, aseptic presentation, validating, receiving the patient properly, positioning to avoid any kind of pressure injuries, intubation, forward catheter placement, skin prep, studies that have been done and have established that there's often the IFU of the, of the provider, whether it's core prep or dura prep or whatever the, the, the prep is, not always followed. The draping, maintenance of the sterile field, pre and post counts, everything matters. Flow of people in and out of the room. The previous speaker mentioned the he had he had listed a study by Dahlstrom in 2008. All they did under the protocols of the study was set up a room. They did this multiple times. With with the, in the sets they had culture plates, and under the protocols of the study, all they did was open the door. There was nobody in the room. All they did was open the door every 10 minutes and close it. At the end of 30 minutes, 15 percent of the sets were contaminated. At the end of an hour, 22% of the sets were contaminated. Well, what are these contaminants? Well, in, in, you can go into, the, into, the, onto the, into any OR in the country almost, go to the back of the equipment tower, and run a finger over a flat edge or a flat surface, and you probably collect, connect, collect enough lint on your fingertip to reflect the color of the scrubs being worn in that surgery. If they're wearing blue, it'll be bluish gray. If they're wearing green, it'll be greenish gray. It's in, lint that this is invisible to the human eye. It's 30 to 100 microns. The human eye can only detect down to about 200 microns, but it's there. And every time that door is open, the airflow in the room is, is abruptly disrupted, and it stirs any, any contaminants that are invisible but present. Now, in the, in the hospital, not only were the nurses my my advocates, but my wife was my advocate. This is her. She's standing in front of a Sherman tank at Ford Mead in Maryland. She's three years old. Her father loved to do this. Her father was career military. There's another photograph of her with a bazooka across her lap. But she was an advocate in certain situations. And if she had not stepped in and said something or done something, something would have happened or wouldn't have happened that should have happened. I'll give you a couple of the quick examples. The chest x-ray, I mentioned there was a story with that. 45 minutes on that Tuesday after they came in to, the, to do that chest x-ray, 45 minutes after that, a second team comes in to take a chest x-ray of Mr. Schmelzer. This is a large medical facility. She challenged him. She said he just had one 45 minutes ago. Does he need another one? He said, well, I, the, the tech said, I have an order for a chest x-ray. She said, is there any chance it's a duplicate? So he checked, and of course it was. Life-threatening? No. Necessary? No. Would they have charged for it? Antibiotic administration. The epidemiologist wanted it administered at 3 o'clock every day. On that first Tuesday, it came up around 4.30. The next day on Wednesday, it came up after five. So for the next 19 days of that hospitalization, every day around 2 o'clock if the nurse wasn't in my room, she'd find the nurse and ask her to please make sure that the antibiotic is being prepped by pharmacy so it is hung somewhere around 3 o'clock. I am hanging on by a shoestring, and it's the little things that matter. And the GI doc, I don't know what he saw, or what he wished he'd seen when he did that endoscopy. But he came in on Wednesday absolutely insisting that he was going to write a script for GERD, for his GERD patient. Now, up to that point in my life, I had never had GERD. And I can tell you that four and a half years later, I still have none of the symptoms of GERD, and I'm not taking any medications related to it. So she 
she basically backed him out of the room. She said, don't write it. He's not going to take it. He doesn't have it. She stood up to him. 12 to 15 hours a day. An absolute rock. Toughest moment. I'll give you a few seconds to read this. I thought I was dying. I was sure I was dying. I understood the diagnosis. I knew how serious it was. And I knew how ill I felt. I had never felt like that in my life. I had nothing left. And I think I'm a pretty tough guy. I was a wrestler. Took care of a herd of 30 horses in summers in, my, summers in high school and college. I had nothing left. I felt like I was just sort of fading into the bed. I was in a good place spiritually. I had asked for forgiveness for my sins and failures in life. I was not afraid of dying. I was afraid of saying goodbye. Friday, January 22nd, surgery number two. Left hip IND, radical debridement, and of course he pulled the hardware. This is directly from the surgeon's notes. Entered the hip abductors in the interval between the anterior middle thirds and the muscle belly. There was an outpouring of fuss, non-weight-bearing space, or when he met with my, with my family afterwards, he described it as raging, MRSA. Kind of a strong descriptive adjective, wouldn't you say? The last book of the Bible is the book of Revelations. I suspect this was a bit of a revelatory moment for him. Remember, 48 hours earlier, he said he didn't think the hip was involved. Unfortunately, over the next seven days, nothing changed. All the cultures kept coming back positive. On the 30th, the epidemiologist came in and he said, Bill, we're going to move you from vancomycin to daptomycin. He explained that daptomycin could be effective against MRSA. But this was OS moment number three. Because while I recognized and understood his explanation, I also knew they didn't have any answers. And they are in absolute scramble mode trying to come up with something that will work. On the 3rd of 1st, surgeon number one who's back from vacation comes in, and he's got an OS look on his face, and this is a good guy. He's about to have a conversation with me. It's not a conversation he wants to have. He said, Bill, we're going to have to do it again. We're going to have to open up both incision lines because now I have an anterior incision and a posterior incision. We're going to do an IND. We're going to fold the space. We're going to put another one in. What are you going to say? No. I said, okay. I trusted him. Now, if you want to create anxiety in a surgical patient, roll them into the pre-op at noon as an add-on case and roll into surgery at 4.45 p.m. I will never forget the last 90 minutes before that surgery. By 3 o'clock, pre-op was cleaned out. The only person left besides myself was the nurse who was busy restocking the other days in the pre-op. My wife was coming in periodically to check on me. She was out with her best friend in the lobby because my children had gone back to work and school, respectively. They were simply on high alert. The surgery itself went okay, but the next 48 hours were absolute misery. Think about it. This is not only the third surgery in 21 days on the same space, it's a third Foley catheter in 21 days. I couldn't get control of my bladder. It took almost 30 hours. And they pulled, they pulled the Foley just as early as possible because, of course, I'm such a high risk for a UTI. So they pull it, and for the next 30 hours, every four or five hours, they're having to cath me because they're pouring IV solution into me. It was absolute misery. But the one positive was the blood work finally turned negative. On Wednesday, a social worker came in, and she's talking to my wife about, do you think he can go directly home? Now, she's looking at me, and she's got to go back to work. She hasn't been to work in three weeks. She said, I don't think so. So they made arrangements to send me to a rehab facility. The hospitalist comes in on Thursday, and she says, I've scheduled a pick line for tomorrow morning. Pick team will be in first thing in the morning. If everything goes well, we'll send you to the rehab facility tomorrow evening. The PIC team comes in at 8 o'clock in the morning. I've got the 10-year senior team leader and the new nurse out of ICU who's seen one, and now she's going to do one. 
they did the full max barrier setup, and the whole time they're setting up, draping me out and thinking, I really don't want to be the do one. I don't know if she went at too steep an angle, too shallow an angle. I don't know if she went through it or past it. But what she managed to do is absolutely nailed the nerve and lit my arm on fire. I pulled back. She pulled back. The whole thing came out. The team, senior team leader took over. They did a reset, and she completed the procedure. I was trans, transported via ambulance that evening. And when they weighed me in, I weighed 138 pounds with scrubs and tennis shoes on. In 21 days, I'd lost 19 or 20 pounds. I don't recommend MRSA as a diet plan to Weight Watchers. After the weigh-in, I turned back towards my wife. I said, well, honey, I don't get any skinnier and sexier than this. She laughed, too. One quick story in the rehab center. I got the OT down right away. The PT, they, the third day, the physical therapist, young physical therapist, wanted to do electrical stimulation like quadricep. I don't know if she'd ever used the device before. She attached the leads to the, to the electrodes. She starts dialing up the machine. She says, now, when you feel the buzz, you let me know. I'm getting nothing. I can't feel anything. She says, don't you feel anything yet? I said, nope. She checks the circuit. She realizes she hasn't actually completed the circuit. She didn't completely plug it in. But she doesn't dial it down. She just hit it. I looked down. When I landed back on the table, I looked down at my quadricep to see if it was smoking. And the irony of all of this as we got to know each other, and I kidded her incessantly about it, trying to electrocute me. But when, when we got to know each other better, it turned out that she was the daughter of one of my neighbors. Proof positive I'm not making any of this up, I think. I went home on the 26th. IV daptomycin probably would have been more fun if it had been Guinness or Patron. Daily love enough shots. My wife's giving me the shots, a tiny little needle. I couldn't even feel it going in, but she was not comfortable home physical ther therapy, and home care nursing. So what do you do? The protocol is two and a half months with a non-weight-bearing spacer. I grew up in a family that didn't allow the question, why me? My parents were the children of the Depression, newlyweds at the beginning of World War II. My father was in the South Pacific for three years. There was no asking in our family, why me? The only question... What now? My boss stole my laptop because you're not allowed to work when you're on short-term disability. And she knew if I had it, I'd be working because I'm a worker. So I talked to the physical therapist. We, I told her, we need to put a workout together for me that I can do with a non-weight-bearing spacer and an abduction brace on. So she had me pull a, pull the wheelchair up to about five feet from the couch. I'd stand up on my right leg. I started doing push-ups off the end of the couch. Weren't very many to begin with. I don't watch TV, so I'm a reader, so I would read. But in the mornings, I would, I would get up, I would have breakfast, I'd do a little reading, and then I'd do a workout. First few workouts were 10, 12 minutes max. I just didn't have any energy. Because the one thing I can tell you about so post-sepsis syndrome and you can Google it. There are a number of websites where people describe their experience with sepsis at this level, level three sepsis. For me, not only was there discomfort in my joints, but the, the fatigue level was absolutely unbelievable. It happened every day at a, somewhere between 1030 and noon. The feeling felt like it, it felt like it was coming right out on my toes. And I knew if I didn't go lay down, I would simply fall down. And I'd go into the bedroom, I'd lay down on the, on the bed. It wasn't like falling asleep. It was like passing out. And I'd be gone an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours, just out cold. And I'd get up and take, have some lunch. And then I played the French horn since I was nine years old. I always wondered if I should have pursued it professionally. So you're trying to take control of a life that you've con completely lost control of. So I just started taking master classes off of YouTube and practicing again. And by the time I got to the reimplant, I was practicing about three or four hours a day. Uh, I sounded great. No one could hear me. On May 9th, was the reimplant. If you've seen the movie The Revenant, in 
Leonardo DiCaprio's mauled by a grizzly bear. He's freezing to death in the North Woods. I don't know what my core body temperature was, but when I came out of anesthesia, I was shaking like a leaf in the wind. They piled so many warming blankets on me, I don't think I could have gotten off that bed if I had wanted to. And they wrapped my head in a warming blanket. And the whole time, I'm thinking, you lose a degree and a half of core body temperature. There's an association with complications for post-operative infection and, and post-operative complications. It took almost two hours to regain that normal thermia. My blood pressure tanked. The first time I looked at the monitor in, in, in post-op, it was 80 over 40. So it was supposed to be two nights, became four nights. And there was a, a near fall event. On the third morning, the, the, the physical therapist came in to get me up for the first time because my blood pressure had finally stabilized enough to be, be able to make that attempt. She swings my legs out of the bed. She slides me down to the end of the bed. It's an air mattress. So I have an arterial line in my left wrist. I have an IV line in my right wrist. She's, she attaches the security belt. She has an aide bringing the IV pole around from the backside. She's lifting the line up and over my head. Now, all of the air in the mattress is going north towards the head of the bed. I'm sinking into the frame. My hands are killing me. She's got the walker right in front of me. So I push off to get up onto the walker because I've been using this thing for two and a half months. I know how to use this thing. The wheels of the bed weren't locked. The bed starts to slide out. She drops the line and tried to grab the security belt, but she missed. And the only stop, the only thing that stopped the bed from rolling out is it ran into the tech, the the, the uh, aid that she was bringing it around from the backside of the of the bed. Or I think I I made the floor and we'd have had a never event, a near falls event. On the 17th, eight days later, I popped an inguinal hernia from opioid constipation and just to put a little cherry on top of all of this, had a hernia, mesh hernia repair on the 19th. PPE for the isolate. This is very relevant for sterile processing because you are just as at risk for exposure when you're in deco as anybody in that operating room. The facility I was in used these, I think you can see it pretty clearly, open back gowns that are often used for decontamination, plastic film, thumb hooks, but they're open in the back. And AMI's recommendation is 360 degree coverage. And there were three occasions when I was alert enough to notice. When the backside of the nurse came into contact with the bed linens or the bed frame, well, where's she going after she finishes with me? She's going to the next patient. She's going to the nurse's station and sit down or she's going to the lounge for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. How to bug spread in this environment. Get preachy with you about facial protection, particularly in deco, masks, if you're wearing them underneath your, your, your uh, visor. Don't leave them hanging when you're done. There's a study done in 2007-2008 in, in Great Britain, Dr. Davis's. He, he, they measured any contamination on the outer facing of, of the masks of all of his procedures over the course of an entire year, 384 surgeries. 45% of the masks had some kind of contamination on the outer facing of the mask. So when I see people drop them down and wearing them as necklaces or spin them around while they're eating something and then spin them back to go back to work, maybe to the next case, in the case of perioperative personnel, I'm thinking you're really not doing yourself any favor, and you're certainly not doing the next patient any favor. Multiple phlebotomists pulled the fingers off the glove to palpate. They were taking daily blood draws. There were eight IV changes because they're changing the IV position every three days. And where are they going after they're done? And we know how contaminated a nail bed can get. And, yes, they did do their wash-up. I watched but they're still going patient to patient all day long. Clinical staff compliance was pretty high. Other than one nurse on the third shift in that first 21 days, she, every time she came into the room, she had gloves on when she came over to the bedside, but she never put the gown on. The big yellow isolation sign out on the, on the, on the frame of the door. Medical staff compliance was pretty high. Um, epidemiology, infection control, surgeon number one, they all put the, 
the gowns on when they came in the room. The only one who wasn't compliant? Probably can guess it. Surgeon number two, for the six days that he was responsible for me, he came in every, every morning at 6 a.m. He's in his surgical scrubs, put no gown on, no gloves on. Now, he never came over to the bedside, but he invariably went over to the laptop to check the progress notes, the arrogance of that. And there was a staff exposure incident. On the third day of that reimplant, after that near falls event in the morning, that evening, I had, I had dozed off. I, I, I wake up and I look down and the arterial line is leaking. There's blood all over the, all over the bed. So I called, I called the, the nurse. She got a hold of the hospitalist and got an order to remove it because they weren't really using it anyway. And she's, she's taken out in a positive pressure arterial line, young nurse. She's gowned and gloved, but she's got no facial protection on whatsoever. She pulls a line and somehow manages to spray her face. There was blood all over her. It was up into her hairline, on her forehead, on the bridge of her nose, on her chin. I said, you have to, re you have to, re you have to report that. She said, please don't say anything to my manager. She's wiping the blood off with a towel. I didn't say anything, but I said, I said to her, how, how, how do you know you didn't get any in your eyes and your mouth? She said, well, my mouth was closed and I didn't feel anything in my eyes. Total cost. I think it's safe to say at this point that I'm standing on a hit that's somewhere between 1.5 and $1.6 million. They invoiced $1.2 million for the first 21 days and three surgeries. The hospital reimbursement was 434000 But that did not include the four nights in that step-down ICU unit after the re-implant. It didn't include the two and a half weeks in the rehabilitation facility. It didn't include the home physical therapy and nursing or the outpatient physical therapy. So I think 1.5 to 1.6 probably probably a conservative estimate and it's not over and I don't believe it'll ever be over on 620 of 2017 I'm taking a shower I look down at the distal end at the bottom of the anterior incision line and there's a round red spot it's about the size of a pencil eraser this is another OS moment over the next 13 days it slowly spread out raised up opened up and started weeping serous fluid the original diagnosis was a seroma, but that would be highly unusual on an orthopedic incision line. It had to be surgically removed. That was August 4th of 2017. After the removal, surgeon number one explored underneath. He found a fragment of suture, an absolute harbor for the, for the, the immune system, right? Those macrophages that are wallers of the immune system. And I think what it probably was, and he pretty much agreed, although they didn't do pathology on it, is that that white mass that emerged there, it was, it was probably a granuloma. And at the center of that white mass, probably another fragment of suture. He did not see a track directly down to the hip, but he saw one laterally towards the posterior incision. He cultured and closed. That was on a Friday. He called on Monday the 7th. He said, you ready to get the drain out? I said, sure, I'll take it out right here. He said, no, 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 come on down. We'll take it out for you. I need to talk to you. I said, about what? He said, well, I have the cultures back. Well, as soon as he said that, I knew what the results were. I said, I'm positive, aren't I? He said, yeah, all four culture sticks came back positive for MRSA. This precipitated a pick line in September. Um, and then, unfortunately, it was the IV daptomycin and, and oral rifampin. And about four weeks into the eight-week regimen, I blew a significant allergic reaction, and and had discontinued all antibiotics at that point. And still today, I'm on absolutely nothing. In the in between, in but if you fast forward to 2018, in it, it, at first, it looked like a bruise. It was right in between the two incision lines. But over the course of the next 30 days, it 
it raised up. It didn't spread out, but it raised up. It was starting to develop a soft center. I called the physician's PA. He called me back. I told him what was going on. He said, come on down to my office. I'll take a look at it. When I got into his, his exam room, he, he, he took a look at it. He said, I want to I put a needle into this. I said, okay. So he, he lit me up with a little topical lidocaine. He puts a needle into it, pulls back on it, and he gets a big, big glob of pus. He said, okay, on Thursday, this was on a Tuesday, he said, come back to my office before my office hours on Thursday. I'll try to do a little IND on this and close it up. So I went into his office that morning. He did the IND. He put three stitches in it, and I went home. Four or five hours later, I had, to, I had to change the dressing, and coming up and around those three stitches was nothing but pus. So I called him back. He said, come back in on Monday. He said, I'll take the stitches out. And that sinus tract that had developed has been weeping serous fluid and pus ever since. It's almost two years since that that, uh, that IND. I had a, the pick line was inserted in September, four weeks in, I blew a large reaction. You can see my arm there uh, on the far right side. I, I didn't have any respiratory symptoms, but I looked like one big hive from neck to ankle. It was unbelievable how fast it progressed. I did the hip aspiration on 1116, it was positive. In the appointment with the surgeon, they described, and I've had several different surgeons that I have met with now, they described different potential scenarios, none of them particularly positive for a hip that is infected. So at some point, there will have to be a revision to the revision. I just don't know when. For the moment, I'm doing relatively well. Amazingly, the hip doesn't hurt. The implant does not appear to be loosening up. And as long as that sinus tract is open and weeping, I'm able to tolerate it. And until I have to, I'm probably not jumping on that surgical table anytime until I absolutely have to. Because one of the scenarios that all the surgeons that I've talked to have mentioned is that this will be the fifth, and then it would potentially be the sixth surgery on this hip. There's concerns about is there enough bone structure? And if there isn't, once they hammer out that implant, if there isn't enough bone structure, the only alternative is amputation. According to the psychiatric community, there are only four human emotions, joy, sadness, fear, and anger. I can assure you, my family and I have experienced all of these emotions through the course of this. The joy of surviving, the joy of celebrating birthdays and anniversaries and holidays. My, I, my son graduated from college in May of 2018. I was there. The sadness at the lost opportunities. Right after he graduated, I sent my wife and son to Ireland for 10 days. Top of her bucket list, she is a, a wee bit of the Irish in her, don't you know? And a, a reward for his academic performance, which was outstanding because he got his mother's brain, thankfully. Fear, because, you know, the sadness is I didn't go. Because I couldn't take the, I knew I couldn't take the beating of international travel. Fear, not a dying. We're all gonna, we're all gonna cross that threshold someday. Fear of saying goodbye. And anger, it is hard to let go of the sentiment towards surgeon number two. For the way he treated my wife on that Monday morning is so dismissive. For the risk I think he put my life in. And for his rather suspect judgment over the next six days, it's hard to let that go. I'm not sure where thankfulness fits among these four human emotions. I think it's a fifth human emotion. I think the psychiatric community forgot this one. And I'm thankful for a lot of things. I am particularly thankful this morning for your time. Time is singularly the greatest gift we are given. 
And it is certainly the most valuable possession that any of us has. I have one more story for you. I think it's the most important one. On May 1 of 2017, I went in to see surgeon number one for one year follow-up to the re-implant. I hadn't seen him in six months. We went over the implant. We went over the x-ray. We went over the, the implant looked good. My right hip, eh, not too much. We talked about how difficult the rehab had been. It was, it was challenging. It was not easy. We were winding down the appointment. I said to him, I'd like to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with you. It was the second time I had seen an OS look on his face. I said, it's not what you think. He said, okay. I said, you and I both know this can happen to anybody, anywhere, anytime we are dealing with invisibles. Heads going up and down. I said, there's no lawsuit. There'll never be one. I signed that waiver. I knew what it said. I knew what it meant. And I wouldn't do that to you. Folks, this, at the time of this conversation, he was just starting his fourth year out of his residency. He's a good doctor. He's a good surgeon. He's a good man. I think he's going to do a lot of good for a lot of people for a long time. This, this wasn't about negligence or incompetence or malfeasance. Those things happen. We probably all could share a story. But I don't believe for a minute that that's what this was. I said to him, I said, I harbor no resentment towards you whatsoever. None. Zero. Now he's starting to relax. He realizes, okay, this really isn't going to be a crazy patient confrontation. I said, you know how many people I know in this surgical community? I've been calling on these people for 27 years. He said, yeah, I know. I said, he disappeared for eight months in 2016, and when I showed up again, I was on a cane. I was 12 pounds lighter. I didn't look very good. People wanted to know what had ha happened. Doc, I shared with them what happened. The first two questions everyone asked, and I mean everyone, where did you have this done, and who did it? Doc, I never tell them where. I never tell them who, and I never will. I will not do that to you. Now, all of his defenses are down. I said to him, my question for you is how has this affected you? Because I think I'm your first train wreck. He said, yeah, you are. I said, how has this affected you? He said, when I see your name on the appointment schedule, my stomach turns inside out. I said, you need to let that go. When I walked up to your receptionist this morning, I told her, just tell Doc his favorite patient's here. He'll know who it is. And then he said, I'm not doing anterior hips anymore. I'm doing everything posterior using the robotic technology. He did his residency in anterior hips. That's one of the reasons that I went to him. But because of the technological development, and maybe a little bit because of what happened with this patient, he's completely changed that that portion of his medical practice as it relates to total hip arthroplasty. And then he leaned forward. He took a little bit of a breath. He looked me in the eye and he said, I'm really sorry that this happened to you. Now, no one had said that up to that point in time. And I don't know that he had to say it, and I don't know that I had to hear it. He said it, and I thought he meant it. I thought it was sincere and heartfelt. And when I went out to the parking lot, I felt pretty good about where that conversation had gone. And my hope was, when he went in to see the next patient, that maybe the, the guilt and the burden that he was carrying in that backpack was a little bit lighter. Now, fast forward, because here's the lesson. Fast forward just seven weeks from May 1 of 2017 to June 20th of 2017, when that round red spot shows up on that anterior incision line, an incision line that had been closed, clean, and dry for 16 months. If I had gone into that appointment on May 1 and ripped him a new one, told him how awful this whole experience was, and it's all his fault, and I'll never forgive him, and we're all done, or threatened him with some kind of litigation, where would I have been when that thing showed up? On February 2nd of 2018, 
I presented this presentation to the orthopedic residents and attendants at Ohio State University. At the end of the presentation, I said, so if I showed up in your exam with this history and said I need my right hip done, or God forbid, the revision of the revision of the left one, would you be willing to take this patient? That auditorium was carpeted. You could hear the pin hit the floor. It was so quiet. Now, I have moved on from surgeon one, number one, but if I asked him, he would do his best in this situation of the revision. And I've only moved on simply because there are people out there who have more experience with infected joints than he has. But if I needed to go back to him, I would not hesitate. I told you at the beginning of the presentation I had three unstated objectives. The first one is I'm typically doing this presentation for perioperative staff at 6 or 7 in the morning or 3, 4, or 5 in the afternoon or evening. People are either coming into a hard day or coming off of a hard day. They may have had a short night, and they have other responsibilities if I can keep everybody awake. The second unstated objective is this is so personal, but I don't want it to be self-indulgent. When I was thinking about doing I put the deck together with the notes. I sent it to three people, two of them clinicians who have known me for a very long time. And Dr. Wave Etrusca, who is your next speaker, who used to be a colleague of mine when we were both at Kimberly Clark. I asked them for honest feedback. Is this worth doing? Will people get anything out of it? Is it worth their time? I got a you should try from everybody. And Dr. Truscott, who is outstanding, has been very helpful in all of this. And the third unstated objective, and the real reason that I decided to try and do this, is I have tremendous respect for what you people do. I've been calling on the perioperative environment and sterile processing for 31 years. It, these are such tough jobs. It takes tough people. And I use the word tough in the very best sense of that word, what you do is demanding, it is relentless, and it is ever-changing. If change is a four-letter word for you, you have chosen the wrong career path. I have met so many clinicians in those three decades, people truly committed to excellence. I suspect it describes most of the people in this audience, or you wouldn't be listening to this if it didn't. If hearing this presentation helps you maintain and sustain that commitment to excellence, then that's why I'm doing it. Because as all of you know, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, maintaining that level of excellence is not an easy thing to do. If you've lost your edge to excellence, I hope that hearing this helps you get that edge to excellence back. If you've been there, you know how to get back there. And if you're burned up and burned out, and it can be a burn up, burn out business, my message is this. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being burned out. The jobs are so hard, so demanding, that you can't stay there. Because everything you do matters. You can't stay in that, in that situation. Everything you do has an impact. Take a step back. Take a deep breath. Do a real self-assessment. I'm not talking about a performance review. I'm talking about a gut check. Make a determination about your purpose and whether you can bring some of your passion to it. And either recommit to what you're doing or move on. Because every patient that comes into your facility who entrusts themselves to your care is hoping. And in a good many cases, they are praying for excellence from you and everybody on that team in that operating room on their day. I appreciate your time. Happy to answer any questions you may have. God bless and thank you. Bill, I think the entire audience tuned in right now has worked through the joy and the sadness and the fear and the anger that you mentioned in your presentation on your behalf. And some of the comments that have come through, uh, folks have experienced 
this themselves um, with friends and family members who have gone through surgical site infections. Uh, I know we're all incredibly thankful for your willingness to share your story with us. And as we all start to come out of the, honestly, the stunned state that this information has left us in, feel free to, to submit a question for Bill. We did have a couple questions come through. Majority of what's come through is honestly just a sincere thank you. Bill, for your bravery and your willingness to share this information. One attendee said, as a member of a surgical team, we rarely hear about surgery outcomes. So thank you for sharing your story and all the best to you. Uh, I do have a question for you. Um, what is the general attitude from hospital administrators? Are you just a statistic to them or do you feel like there's a genuine interest in improving because of your experience? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to beg forgiveness here because I'm really having a hard time hearing because I have a, I have some hearing issues. Can't spend 30 years or 40 years playing French horn without having some hearing issues. Um, can you just repeat the core of that? Yes, I can actually type it into the chat box between you and I if that's easiest. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I wish I could remember the quote. I think it was Stal Joe Stalin who said that a single death is a is a tragedy. Multiple deaths, millions of deaths, is just a statistic. I think that's roughly what he said. Um, when people hear the presentation, it generally has a pretty significant effect. But I haven't done it for a lot of hospital administrators, so I don't. I, I can't really answer that question. I think it would. On the one couple of occasions where I have done it with hospital administrators present, it does have an impact. You know, one of the concerns in all of this is room turnover, right? Because we don't know the origins of my infection. We have no idea where that bursa came from. Theoretically, I wasn't the source. 25 to 35% of all surgical site infections, the patient is the ultimate source of it. But theoretically, I wasn't contaminated or colonized with MRSA, so where did it come from? I really probably never know. But would it, would it impact if they heard it? I think so. I just need an opportunity to present it in that kind of a forum. Okay, wonderful. We have reached the end of the presentation time. As Bill mentioned, when he set out to do this presentation, Dr. Weva Truscott was one of the key people that he consulted with. Uh, Dr. Truscott brought Bill into her presentation at the 2018 AORN conference. Weva brought the science and Bill brought the patient perspective. And that right there is such a powerful combination. So I'm excited for you all to join us in the next session where Dr. Weva Truscott will talk about sterile processing's role in the patient experience. Bill, from all of us, thank you so much. You're an inspiration and your story will hopefully be told in so many departments across the globe. I know we have people tuned in from many countries. So thank you again, everyone. Grab a healthy snack or some lunch and tune back in at 1145 Eastern for Dr. Wave Truscott.